If you look at the black curve here, that represents a sequence that has some pretty big jumps in it. And a common way to try to smooth out those jumps is to do what's called a moving average. So if we wanted to find this blue value, it's the average of the four most recent black values. And that smooths out the curve considerably. So if we are given this original sequence of Vs, we can define a smoothed out sequence of Ws by taking this kind of moving average of the most recent values. We might want a fancier average that doesn't just give equal weight to every point. You might want to give more weight to the recent past. So we can just replace those one quarters with some other sequence of values and write the whole thing with sigma notation. And when we write this sum, you'll notice that the indices of the two vectors here always add up to j when I'm trying to find wj. Now let's say we're given two functions, f and g. We can define a new function from them in a similar way. We'll call the new function h, and we'll write it as f star g. The value of h at time t is an integral of f of t minus tau, g of tau d tau. Now an integral is the continuous version of a sum, and the way this integral is written, the variables, the arguments of the functions here, add up to t, to get h at time t. So there's a very close analogy with the sum. And this f star g is something we call the convolution of f and g. In many ways, convolution resembles multiplication. For example, suppose I tried to find g star f. By definition, it's g of t minus tau times f of tau d tau. I'll define a new integration variable as z equals t minus tau, so dz is negative d tau. So now when tau is 0, z is t, and at the other end z is 0. tau is t minus z, and d tau is negative dz. And I'll use that negative sign to just reverse the order of integration. And we can see that this is the definition of f star g. So g star f equals f star g. Convolution is commutative. There's some other properties you can prove from the definition. Convolution is also associative. Second, convolution is distributive. Third, f convolved with the zero function is the zero function. 
And finally, there's one that's a little bit different. f convolved with the delta function equals f. So the delta function acts like the commutative or like a multiplicative identity. And here's a big result known as the convolution theorem. It's quite easy to state. If x is f convolved with g, then the transform of x is the product of the transform of f and the transform of g. Well, we could write this using the transform notation. transform of a convolution is the product of the transforms. So why does this matter? Here's our second order linear problem with constant coefficients. We're going to assume zero initial conditions throughout all of this. So when we solve for the transform of the solution, we get capital F of S divided by the characteristic polynomial. And we can write this as capital F times capital G of S, where G is what we've called the transfer function. That means when we inverse transform, go back to time, x is a convolution between little g and little f. As always, little g is the inverse transform of big G. And that's what we call the impulse response. That's because if we set up the impulse problem with zero initial conditions still, the transform of delta is just one. So it's just the transfer function times one. x of t is the impulse response, but then capital X is equal to capital G, so G of t is the impulse response. As we've said before, the transfer function is the Laplace transform of the impulse response. And it's all because of the convolution theorem and the fact that the transform of delta is 1. So we have that we can write the solution of our differential equation as a convolution integral. In a sense, then, the impulse response actually tells you how to solve every problem. And when we did variation of parameters in the first order problem, I'll just write it out for the scalar case, but it's very similar for the vector case. This formula is already in that form with the integral there. And in fact, this exponential was the impulse response of the first order problem. Now we ask, what does the impulse response look like in the second order problem? 
Well, again, its transform is 1 over the characteristic polynomial. The roots of the characteristic polynomial are the eigenvalues, and we can write this in partial fraction form. As usual, clear the denominators. and substitute in the pole values one by one to determine A and B. Now we know our partial fraction decomposition. and we can invert it to find our impulse response. So x is the solution of our impulse problem. I should really call this g of t. One thing to note, g of 0, you can see, is 1 minus 1, so it's just 0. But g prime of 0 is lambda 1 times 1 minus lambda 2 times 1 divided by lambda 1 minus lambda 2. So g prime of 0 is just 1. So that means in the second order problem, an impulse is the same thing as a unit step or a unit jump in the derivative of the solution. In the first order problems, it causes a jump in x. In second order problems, it causes a jump in x prime. And here's a numerical example. The transfer function is 1 over the characteristic polynomial, which we can write in terms of partial fractions. Do the usual thing, clear the denominators to find a and b. Uh, hi, sorry, I've got to interrupt myself here. I made a little boo-boo. Um, I got the wrong sign on a and b. a should be negative one quarter and b should be positive one quarter. And that's going to propagate throughout the rest of this example. So just make a note of that if you're relying on this example for something. Sorry about that. All right, I'll just continue now. So our impulse response is a combination of e to the minus 3t and e to the t. That means we can write the solution as a convolution. Which, if we break it out, is an e to the minus 3t times an integral involving f. and e to the t times an integral involving f. Another example, or really a case study, since this is such an important equation, is the undamped oscillator. transfer function is 1 over s squared plus omega naught squared. So right away we can inverse transform and get 1 over omega naught times the sine of omega naught t. Uh, 
So we have an integral formula for x using the convolution. If we use the sine of the difference formula, we can break this up into two separate integrals. We get a combination of sine omega naught t times an integral with f against the cosine. And we get a cosine omega naught t times an integral with sine and f.